Salutations, and this video is a video lesson that goes along with Chapter 2 of Intro to Communications course, and the chapter is Exploring Self-Awareness and Communication. So if you see me looking off screen, I have my, my book and my notes off to the side so I can just kind of gather. Uh, as always, there are PowerPoint presentations and Word documents that go along with every lesson that we go over. This is... I just like to be that extra and do video lessons as well. They're not for every single chapter, but for the majority they are. So let's go ahead and get into it. Let's talk about self-awareness and, the and you know, it's just communication, self-awareness within communication. The book, I'm going to give you the book's definition of self-awareness. It's the capacity to observe and reflect on our own mental states. So it's Self-awareness is just being aware of where we are in the world at that moment. If we're happy, if we're sad, if we're angry, if we're disgruntled, if we're ecstatic, if we're elated, confused, worried, all of that falls under self-awareness. They roll it into the next terminology is called symbolic self-awareness. And symbolic self-awareness is the unique human ability to develop communi and communicate a representation of our oneself to others through language. And through language, they're talking, they're not just talking about our verbal language, but also our nonverbal language. And we go way more into depth in this in the chapters that cover verbal language and nonverbal language. So I'm not gonna like dive deep into that with this video lesson. We're just talking about self-awareness itself. Um, so let's just build off of that. Those are the book's definitions for self-awareness and symbolic self-awareness. Now, the book then goes on to talk about, it's Abraham Maslow, and he, he has come up with a four-step process or four key process or four key points that he talks about in the realm of self-awareness. So let's talk about those four points. The first one he discusses is unconscious incompetence. And what does that mean? We don't know what we don't know. We're just, we're just unaware of what we don't know. Pretty straightforward. The next one is called conscious incompetence. And at this level, we are aware of what we don't know. Here's my example for that. So when it comes to a vehicle, if it's an oil change or fluids need checked or a tire change, I can do that. But if there's something more, if it's my radiator or a bigger problem with my motor, the transition, transmission, not transition, excuse me, or there's body work to be done, I know that I don't know that. So I take it to someone who does. Okay, if I get hurt and I slice my hand open, cutting vegetables or my kids get hurt and they slice a hand open or they break an arm I'm aware that I don't know how to fix that unless it's putting a band-aid on a tiny nick I can't fix it I can't reset bones I can't do stitches I can't do that stuff so I take I, I go to someone who does so that's what they're talking about with Conscious and incompetence. You know that you don't know it. The next level, so the next point, or the next phase, however you go about this, is called conscious competence. And this is, we, we are aware or we know a habit or skill, but we don't know it deeply. So this is when you're just learning a craft or a subject. You're just starting to learn. So whatever you go on to be, this is the, the learning phase. You know, sometimes when you apply for jobs, it'll say years of experience. This is the years of experience part of competence, of, you know, getting to know yourself, getting to know the craft, getting to know all of this. So you know how to do it. You've read and you, you know but it's not so well versed in your mind or in your body that it's just become second nature, which leads us into the very last one.
which is unconscious competence. You know the craft or the trade or the skill so well, it's like second nature to you. You could do it in your sleep. You know, maybe it's something you do all the time. This could be working on cars. This could be making shirts. It's really popular right now. Excuse me. It could be building models. It could be playing a particular sport. You know, my example for this is making clothes. And I'm talking about making pants and dresses and skirts and stuff like that. I started sewing at a very young age. I worked and I sewed all through, you know, middle school and high school, college. I went to, you know, I worked in professional theater in costuming, making costumes. So now I don't really have to think, I don't have to get patterns out and I don't have to sit there and go, okay, I need this particular kind of fabric and I have to cut it this way. It's just, I grab the fabric. I know how it needs to be cut to make what I want it to make. I understand the basics of this will make a better skirt as opposed to this, or this will make a better pair of pants or pajama pants. I don't have to think and I don't have to pull stuff out. I can just pull out fabric. I can cut it. I can sew it and I make it. And that's only because I have been working with this craft for so long, for so many decades. That's why. And then you see people perhaps that cook or bake. You watch the cooking shows and you see people that they don't even think about and they make these super complex dishes. You're like, oh my gosh, or these super complex like baked dishes. And you're like, oh, that that's wild because they don't think about it. They're just, they don't look at the ingredients. They, I mean, the recipe, they, they don't have to have a recipe there. They just know. They're like, okay, we put this egg, we put this flour, we put the salt, the sugar. And it kind of looks like the Swedish chef from the Muppets, a flute of learn. And then all of a sudden it's magic. Poof. That's delicious. Like it's a from scratch. They know, they just know. And they've done it so long. It's second nature. So that's what we're talking about. So again, let's recap these four key points. It's unconscious incompetence. We don't know what we don't know. Conscious incompetence. We know what we don't know. Conscious competence. We know, we are aware, we're, we're building there. We are aware of what we know. And unconscious competence is, we know what we know very well. It is second nature to us. So that's what Maslow talks about in the well, of how well do you know yourself? These are building, I don't even want to say building blocks. There's just four key points that Maslow has pointed out in breaking down our self-awareness and our symbolic self-awareness, because self-awareness is how we are aware of ourselves, but symbolic self-awareness is what we put out there for people to take in about us. So let's build on from there. We move into the self-concept world, and self-concept is, who are you? Who are you? Okay. The book... I'm going to give you two definitions straight from the book. It's called From Self and Self-Concept. So self, the book tells us, is the sum of who you are as a person. This is your, this is you. This is who you are inside. And then self-concept is our interior identity or subject, subjective description of who we think we are. This is who we think we are. So we have self, which is who we are, and self-concept, who we think we are. Which, again, it says subjective, and it can be subjective, because what one thinks is good or bad may not be good or bad as a whole to society, or right or wrong, and therefore. So within self-concept, it gives us three, three factors, three factors that fall under self-concept. And this is attitudes, beliefs, and values. So attitudes is kind of, is our learned predisposition of our responses to persons or places or activities or things. So really much, pretty much, it's your likes or dislikes, okay? The book gets, gives example, you know, Susie likes ice cream, okay? I don't come at me. I like pineapple on pizza. I don't really eat pizza a whole lot. Like, I have to be really in the mood, but I like pineapple on pizza. Like I said, please don't come at me. 
<laughs> Nobody started saying to me, are you crazy? I know it's not everyone's jam, but that's my like. That's what I like. And I, I like brownies, but again, I have to be in the mood for it. And I'm not a corner, I'm not an edge kind of brownie person. I want like the ooey gooey centerpiece. I don't want the, I'm not big on the crunch, you know, it's likes and dislikes. I I use food a lot as examples because it's universal. Cookies. Some people like a crispy cookie. Like a crispy, you have that texture, you have that, when you take that bite. And then some people prefer like a cakey cookie. They're really soft and really just, it's like little cakes in your mouth type situation. Those all comes with likes and dislikes. I, I like vanilla and I like strawberry. Those are like my two favorite. Like if I'm going to go with ice cream, that's usually that. Or I'm going to go crazy and do mint chocolate. My son prefers chocolate. Chocolate ice cream, chocolate cake. And he's the only one in my household that that's his like. So when we're celebrating something and it's centered around him, birthdays or whatever else. And when you ask him what he wants, it's usually a chocolate cake. So that's a like and dislike within our own household. That is one of three. So that is attitudes. Now, the beliefs that come after attitudes or beliefs, which also fall under self-concept, are the ways which we structure our understanding of reality. So this is what true, this is basically breaks down to what is true and what is false. So, you know, if you're in a relationship, you believe to be true. You know, if you're in a relationship, your idea of true and false is you are in a relationship. True. You are in love. That is true. That falls under true and false. I'm just using kind of a, the book gives the example is that you believe your parents to love you. So you believe your car, you know, true to you is that your guardians love you. Or that maybe family comes first. is true for you. Or there's those adages Blood is thicker than water. Well, in some cases, water is much nicer than blood. That's kind of a weird to, way to say it, but, you know, we ha it's just our sense of what is true and false in our, our world. Not the world as a whole, but in our media world. This is self-concept. This, this is all within yourself. So we have our likes and dislikes, which are our attitudes, and then we have beliefs, which is what we believe to be true or false in our world. And then it falls into values. And this is enduring concepts of what is right or wrong. So, and all again, that's, that all falls within the self-concept of who you are. So we have our self, which is all of us. And then self-concept is our inner workings, our inner thoughts, and how we take the world. And under self-concept, we have our attitudes, which are our likes and dislikes, our beliefs which are are true or false and then values which is what we believe to be good or bad and that that is different for everyone even in a, a house a family unit all of these are different your values your beliefs your attitudes and stuff can vary from your parents who raised you or your guardians it can be different from your siblings. You know, all of this varies because within self-concept, it's who we are on the inside. You can be raised in a particular household, but as you get older, you start gaining experiences, which can change. I don't want to say alter, but you can, you're caught. We're humans and we're constantly evolving. Our thought processes, what we believe, what we feel, what we like, what we don't like, what we hear, what we see, we're constantly evolving. It's constantly changing because of the world around us. And that's just not like the world. It's like our immediate world. You think about it. You go from elementary school and you go to junior high or middle school and then you go to high school. So like your group of friends change for the most part. People that you interact with change. And it can, you know, it can be, ba we get more into this in this chapter anyway. But all that falls under, so it's constantly evolving. So all of these things that fall under self-concept are con they're changing, constantly changing because our world around us is changing. Now let's move into this. We're still in the self-concept world. So next it talks about selves or 
is it one or is it many? When I say this, the many, the it breaks down to multiple selves in our our self concept world. So it talks about the materials, not material self. Let me. The book gives an awesome opening line to this portion of the book, and it's. Perhaps you have said or have heard in your lifetime, I'm just not feeling myself today. And how true is that? There have been times that I wake up and I'm just not feeling it. Or a day has happened and I'm just, it just doesn't feel like me. Doesn't I don't feel like myself. All that. So that's what we're talking about with selves. Now, let's break it down how the book has it. The book talks about your material self. And your material self is... What is tangible? What in this world is around you? This is the the reflected physical. And what do I mean by that? So the material self. Let me age myself. Think of Madonna's material girl song. A material girl living in a material world. In the video, she is basing it off... Gentlemen prefer blondes, Marilyn Monroe. But she's getting diamonds, and she's getting, you know, all these jewelry and candy, and she talks about getting all these great things in material. So, not to go off on a tangent about Madonna, <laughs> let's talk, the material self is, perhaps, it's the clothes you wear. Maybe it's a particular brand. Perhaps it's the jeans you wear, or the jacket you wear, or the hat that you wear, or the shoes that you wear, or the purse that you carry, or the makeup you wear, or the car that you drive, the house you live in, the houses you own, the places you rent. Some people put a lot of emphasis on the material self. They'll only wear maybe a particular brand of clothes. They won't be caught in anything else. Or... They have to have a particular purse, or they have to have this particular brand of sunglasses. They'll wear nothing else, nothing else will compare. You know, a lot of people put into, they put a lot, their self-concept is based a lot off their material self. Okay, okay. The next that the book discusses is the social self. The social self is based off of who we interact with. Or how we interact with others. So, it says this concept of self is developed through your personal and social interactions with others. The best way I can break this down is perhaps you know someone or multiple people that seem to change with people that they hang out with. Depending, you know, what group they hang out with or a particular, they change. It's like they adapt to that person. And that falls under social change. We, it's not, it's sometimes it's a conscious effort. I'm changing. Da, da, da. And sometimes it's a completely unconscious effort. Just because of the amount of time you spend with a group or a particular person. Your self-concept can, I don't want to say it doesn't mold, but it can it's flexible in that sense that you start taking on attributes or ideas or habits like the people you're with. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but it, this is what the social self is in self-concept. Is that you take on, you, you blend there. You blend with the people you're hanging out with or the person you're with. Some people can take that to an extreme, and some people, not so much. It really just depends on, again, the person. But all this falls under self-concept. Now, the last, the last self that they talk about is the spiritual self. Now, I want to preference this with, when they speak about spiritual self, it's not specifically religious. What do I mean is that it's not directly or I think the best word here it's not specific to a religion you were raised in or or a part of 
That's not what they mean when they say spiritual self. Your spiritual self is how you yourself take on the concept of who am I or why am I here? So, it, you know, your religious self falls within this, but it's not all towards that because you can be part of a religious group or sect and still have your own ideologies of the theories. So the spiritual self is just who you are in the universe, who we are in the universe. That's what they're talking about with the spiritual self. So let's just a recap of ourselves. There's the material self, which is the tangible around us. Social self is our interactions with a particular person or groups. And our spiritual self is how we answer, why am I here universally? You know, the why in the world. And that falls under our social social self. So from this is they talk about how self-concept develops. The book breaks it down. There's four key points, four ideas, four theories. There's just there's four attributions to how to develop self-concept. There's it's addressing the question who am I? So researchers break it down with these four. It's our communication with other people, our association with groups, the roles we assume, and our self-labels. So let's talk about communication with others. The book talks about that every time you lose a relationship, you lose an opportunity to see yourself. So what does that mean? In 1902, Charles Horton Cooley gave us the first advanced notion. I'm looking for my book for this, though. That we form our self-concepts by seeing ourselves through a figurative looking glass. We learn who we are by interacting with others, much as we look into the mirror and see our reflection. So by this... When we talk about communication with others and developing our self-concept, it's how we interact with others. It's not just looking around and saying, I am this or that. It's how we also communicate with others within this. Um, and by that, I mean, because if you remember from the communication process, it's back and forth. It's an eternal, you know, we're constantly going. So tip for tat, da, 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 da. In that con in that realm, by talking or verbally or non-verbally communicating with others, we are internalizing feedback or what's a feedback be, which may be positive, which may not be so positive. Do we go from here in, um, you know, maybe in relationships and that's in friendships or intimate relationships. It evolves with the communication. Oh man, they really like they're really open, you know, some people have really open communication styles, like very open, like everything's just, it's all out there. Every emotion, every word, every thought, it just, it just pours out. And some people are more reserved in communication. That's not to say that they never talk. It's just, they have different ways to communicate. So within that, you know, you go, you figure out, you're learning who you are by the, the process of tip for tat for people of communicating back and forth and taking what they say in their feedback and go with the verbal and nonverbal and by talking with someone and maybe they have an idea that you don't really jive with. So you're like, okay, I know not to talk about this or do this with this person. Or maybe it's such an ideology, I really need to still steer clear. Or maybe they just have an ideology that you're like, this is just, this is beautiful. I must know more. That's with communicating with others. This is ways to help us develop our self-concept. Help. This is ways that help us figure out who we are. So underneath this, they talk about identities, and there's two that the book talks about. It's called avowed and ascribed. Avowed identity is, this is the identity we assign to ourselves in portray. So the book gives the I, not the idea, that's not the right word there. They give the, as a student, athlete, your friends. These are things that you call yourself. So, about identities for you would be that you're a student. 
um, perhaps you're an athlete, perhaps you're a farmer, perhaps you're a mechanic, perhaps you're a crafter, perhaps you're a, you know, a nerd or a dork or a buff, you know, whatever the case may be. These are what you identify yourself as. I identify myself as I'm a teacher, I'm a crafter, I'm a baker, I'm a mother. And some of these can overlap with other identities. You'll see when we get to self-labels, what I'm talking about here. Now, a scribed identity is, this is assigned to you by others. So it's not necessarily something you think about yourself, but you learn that people think about you. My, de <laughs> My example of this is, I am an extrovert introvert, more so now. But in my younger years, I was very much an extrovert. I talk a lot. I, if I really know you, I talk even more, which is kind of sad because I talk a lot as is. And I can talk fast and I try, I have more of a perky disposition in life and a perky attitude and always have. When I was going through school and finished college and was out working in the, just starting out in professional theater, I would try to be nice and uh, perky and just, I was being myself, thinking I was being helpful. People were taking my attitudes and I was being, they were labeling me flighty and just kind of aloof when in reality, that's not who I am. I'm very much someone that can take the task and go forward and I'm very good you know, at that position, I was very good at that position. So people were making false assumptions of me just based off of like my, the way I acted. I love to say, don't judge a book by its cover. I really do. Back in the day, I was very much a goth girl, makeup and everything. And, but very perky and very friendly. And I try to be approachable, but it's society. As much as we want to say we don't or we shouldn't, sometimes we don't even realize that we're doing it, that we're judging before we get to know. So take from this, <laughs> get to know. So break down again in this very first developing self-concept, it's communication with others. And we talked about avowed and ascribed. Avowed is what we identify ourselves as and ascribed is what other people identify us as. Let's go ahead and talk about association with groups. Association with groups is awareness of who we are is sometimes linked to groups we're associated with. Perhaps it's where you were born and raised. I'm from Eastern Kentucky, born and raised in Eastern Kentucky. And we, you know, Appalachia is a world of itself. Perhaps you, you know, you hear people say, well, I'm from New York, or I'm from California, or I'm from Dakota, or I'm from Florida. There's... It's an association of where you were raised. And that kind of, you know, when you first meet someone that used to be the, oh, where are you from? Da, 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 da. Or it could be other associations. This could be associations with groups. So it could, these groups can be groups we were born into or groups we choose on our own. So when I say like you're born into, you're born where you're born. Um, and as we get older, we choose our groups. You know, you could be like, well, I'm a proud member. Perhaps you're a colonel here in Kentucky. Or perhaps it was groups you were associated with throughout school. If you were an FFA or FBLA, or maybe you worked on a news, the newspaper or the school paper. Or, you know, perhaps a radio. Or perhaps you were the theater kid. I was the theater kid. Um, I was the art kid. <laughs> These were groups that I was I was associated with in school growing up. Perhaps um, you're in an honors fraternity. That is a group. Uh, perhaps you're part of the Republican Party or the Democratic Party or the youth versions. You know the youth Republican Party used to. Those are groups you're associated with. Um, maybe you're in a book club. You know it just kind of goes on and on and on. But, you know, those are what we choose on our own. And then there's what you choose from. But these are associations with groups. And this helps us develop our self-concept. It's because of association with groups. So the next one is assumed roles. More, more answers to who am I. Assumed roles in our life are like, 
a parent or a sibling or a cousin or a salesperson, teachers, partners, whatever the case may be. Assume roles for me. I am I'm a parent. I'm a mother. I'm a daughter. I'm a sister. I'm a cousin. I'm a niece. I'm a teacher. I'm a partner. You know, all those things fall under assumed roles. Uh, and those imply, like, these roles imply behavior, but not really. It's 20, 22. So these behaviors change. <laughs> what we know, what we thought decades ago was assumed norm for a role, it's not so much anymore, but the roles that we assume are a part of our self-concept. So, like I said, the roles that I assumed is that I'm a mother, I'm a partner, I'm a daughter, I'm a niece, cousin, teacher, dance mom, karate mom. <laughs> These all fall under roles that I assume. And that just means, you know, I take some of my roles, you know, some of our roles we take more seriously than others. I don't want to say more seriously. We just take in more than others. And what does that mean? My wallings are living their best life and I'm their chauffeur because I'm driving all over t the place for extracurriculars when they happen. So those are long. And then our fourth one that falls under how we develop self-concepts are self-labels. So self-labels is even though our self-concept can be influenced by others and our world around us, we are not completely blank slates when we are born and grow up to be completely molded to someone else's idea of who we are. Our labels is what we just is what we put on ourselves with our attitudes and our values and our beliefs. What we like and dislike, what we think is good and bad, what we think is right and wrong. What I think is good and bad, or what I think is right or wrong, or like or dislike, it's not the same as you. It's not the same as my kids. It's not my job to make them think, to tell them what they like or don't like. I can... <laughs> I can help steer them in a direction. I don't want to say even steer them in direction. My role as their parent is to set up good or bad in society. That doesn't necessarily mean when they get older, what I think is good or bad is what they're going to think good or bad. They could go a different route than I am and take completely different beliefs. And that's the beauty of human nature and the human race. We have that ability. But what I'm saying here with self-labels is that our self, our, our self-concept is not completely derived off of what we take in from others. We can take what we take from others and fit it to what we personally believe. And that can change. What you think, what you thought was right or wrong or good or bad as a 12-year-old can change by the time you're 16, can change by the time you're 20, can change by the time you're 25. 35, 45, 55, 60, you know, keep on going. And it's ever changing. But just remember out of all this, because we just discussed self-concept, ways to develop it, and the ways the book talks about communicating with others and the groups we associate with and self-labels and self-labels, the last one, and roles we assume. But we're taking in everything around us and taking it into us and developing how we feel about the situation, how we feel about it all. So all that falls under self, how we develop self-concept. Um, within that, it talks about self-reflexiveness, -reflex reflexiveness. Probably butchered that. But the book's definition is the human ability to think about what you're doing while you're doing it. So again, it's taking in the information and determining yourself does this go with what I think is what I like or don't like or what, you know, like I said, I like pineapple on pizza. Don't come at me, but it's not a lot of people's, it's not a lot of people's cup of tea. Not at all. And it's the same, you know, if you're out with a group of friends and everybody's like, hey, let's have burgers. And you're like, mm, I don't like them, you know, are you going to change what you like because the group 
No. You'll find something, but all that falls under ways we develop. Now let's talk about self-esteem throughout the, the book here. Excuse me. The book's definition of self-esteem is your assessment of your worth or value as reflected in your perce perception of such things as skills, abilities, talents, or appearances. So, the book talks about the feminist author Gloria Steinem explains that it's a feeling or clicking in when self is recognized, valued, discovered. Esteem is we literally plug our inner energy into that as ours alone, yet connects us to everything else. So we all pretty much know self-esteem. We've grown up. We have had blows to our self-esteem. You know, we've had uppers in our self-esteem. There are things that, you know, getting positive remarks or positive feedback that helps our self-esteem. Maybe it's particular, you know, something that you own or something that you bought or something that you did. Maybe there's a project you've been working on and you just haven't got it, you know, you're, you're making something. It's just, it's hard, it's hard, it's just rough. And finally one day it just, you get it. And it makes you feel good. Heck, yeah, I, I've been working hard on that. Perhaps it's like weightlifting or tumbling or something. You've been working on a certain weight that you want to, you know, deadlift. And you're just not getting there. You're getting kind of frustrated and bummed. And then after work and, you know, the time put in, you do it. it. Makes you feel good. You're tumbling. You've been trying to work on a trick. And you're just not landing it. You're not getting it. You're not landing it. And finally, you get it one day and it's like, there it is. There it is. I've been working hard on this. So all, you know, and it's not just stuff like that that falls under self-esteem. It's like our feedback from people, feedback from teachers, from our peers, from co-workers, from family members. Communication with them can, can help build or it can hurt in our self-esteem or perhaps it's how we're looking one day. You know, some days I make the joke I look like a swamp. I feel like a swamp witch. And that's okay. I'm okay with that. But then some days, you know, there's this meme that's like, Mama put on her makeup, move over, Beyonce, I'm back. You know, stuff like that. Or perhaps it's an outfit that you just, it doesn't matter what you're doing, but there's a particular outfit that you put on and you put, and you feel like a go, like a million bucks and it boosts your self-esteem. Just, we've all have dealt with self-esteem, both ups and downs. And that's what we're talking about here in the book. And they put, Underneath that, they also talk about self-concept clarity. Now, the book's definition of self-concept clarity is the extent of which believes upon oneself are clearly and confidently identified and stable over time. So, really, self-esteem is pertains to our current state of mind or view of self, whereas self-concept clarity is over time. I hope that makes sense. So self-esteem is in the moment and self-concept clarity is the extension of over time. Of how we see ourselves. Now, we're going to break down and these aren't going to be as long when I touch base on them because, like I said, we have Word documents and PowerPoint presentations. So under self-esteem, they talk about gender. It's 2022 and gender is more fluid. So older concept and older theories is that gender, self-esteem evolved differently with males and females. And here is my point on that. If you look at ads, it's we're getting more into the body positivity era of the world. But if you look at ads from, we're going to say the 2000s back. So 2000s and 90s and 80s and 70s and 60s and 50s and so forth. Think about ads in women's magazines or for women. If you go back to the decades of like the 50s and the 60s, it was how to be the perfect housewife. 
what you should do to maintain. This is what you should do. This is what, you know. And as the decades, it was like you think of like old Cosmos ad, Cosmo ads and stuff like that. How to be, how to lose 12 pounds in 12 days. How to be bikini, you know, the issue comes out in February, March. How to be bikini ready in just three months. How to get into a size da-da-da within this. The perfect, you know. These ads take quite the toll on self-esteem. And they are geared, they were geared in those decades toward the female body. That's not saying that there wasn't ads toward men's bodies, you know, oh, how to get in shape, how to get the perfect six abs, how to build up your this and this and this. But, you know, and the idea of beauty and runaways and stuff like that. So that's my takeaway on the gender portion of self-esteem. Let's move on. It is social comparisons. And social comparisons is the process of comparing oneself to others to measure one's worth. Social comparison. Again, we're in 2022. It's so used to is be like, oh gosh, blah 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 down the street has a better car than I do, or they have a better job, or this or that. Now, because of social media, between Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, and TikTok, and Snap, you know, all these things, all the social media outlets, you get a glimpse into people's worlds that you want to go a glimpse into before, and this could be celebrities, or, you know, someone down the street, someone states away, someone you don't even know personally, you just, you follow them on these accounts. So you see their daily lives and you see these great Instagram worthy pictures or these perfect photos being posted on all their medias or little snippet videos of like their perfect morning, get ready with me. And they show you their views from their homes. And with that, you're like, oh man, their relationship looks perfect. Their house looks perfect. Their kids look perfect. Their world looks perfect. How I wish, I wish. But we don't really know what goes on in the inside. All we see is what's posted and what's shown to the world. So things like that can kind of bum us out. Like, oh God. Or like, I grew up with this person, graduated with them. They're here and I, we have this, da, 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 da. you know, social comparisons with self esteem is just so much more now with social media because it's, it's so out there. It's so much, it's, it's hard not to sometimes to compare yourself to what you see in these outlets with our self-esteem. And then it talks about self-expectations after that. And self-expectations, according to the, bus, the book, are goals you set for yourself how you ought to behave and what you ought to accomplish. So this is just, you know, maybe you set something for yourself. Okay, by the time I'm 18, I will do this. I don't want to say a bucket list because it's not a bucket list, but quasi kind of like a bucket list. Like these are things I want to accomplish. So if you don't get them accomplished in the timeline you think you should, or you're, you're not meeting the expectations you set for yourself, that can, that can affect our self-esteem and vice versa. If it's, Man, I plan to have this, my career started by the age of 23. 23 roles, your career started in the, you know, boost, 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 boost. So that falls under, it's just what we plan for ourselves. Self-fulfilling prophecy, this is the last thing that it talks about with the self-esteem portion, the self-esteem portion of the book is that, I'm sure you heard it. You got to think positive to be positive. And I've used that on my kids when they don't want to go to school and their stomach hurts because they're stressing. <laughs> if you think bad, if you're going to say, man, I just, I'm never going to get this done on time. I'm never going to get it done on time. It's like, and it doesn't happen. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. You've talked yourself into the negativity of it so much that it happens. So that's where they're always like, be positive. And sometimes you just can't be positive. Your stress and life around you just won't let it happen. It's just, it's just not there. 
So those are the four things that it talks about with self-esteem is that there's that can affect it positively and negatively. But there's gender, there's social comparisons, self-expectations, and self-fulfilling prophecies. The next part is communication enhancement with self-esteem. So it says, the book says we can engage in positive self-talk. And then it gives us intrapersonal communication. And this is how we take in stimuli in the environment or information to make sense of it. It's, it's really the thoughts and ideas that we say to ourselves. We all talk to ourselves. Sometimes we answer ourselves. But in this, we it's engaging in self-positive talk. You know what? I'm going to have a great day today. And sometimes it's hard to talk positive to yourself. It really is. I get it. I have mornings that I'm waking up and I'm trying to acclimate to life by drinking coffee and maybe my kids are home or in a mood so it's like okay you know what today's going to be a great day we're going to get a lot accomplished we're going to do this we're going I'm going to do this or sometimes it's just saying hey it's going to be a good day and it's going to be a chill day I'm going to take this day for myself I'm going to take this day to reflect and just be kind to myself. And sometimes you have to remind yourself to be kind to yourself. We get so wrapped up in school and work and life around us. And it's, that's not a bad thing, but it's a stressful thing. Even if it's positive, it's still stressful. If you're running all the time, if you have, okay, well, I have class from here to here, from this time to this time, and then I got to go from here. Say you have an extracurricular activity. And you run to it, or perhaps your kid has an extracurricular activity, and you run to it, and then you're like, okay, then there, maybe you have to work. And then there's the kid's homework, or maybe there's your homework, or both, and then there's dinner, and then there's whatever the case may be, and it's just, it, it's just, it can be stressful. So we engage, we, we internalize in ourselves, engaging in ourself positivity, positive, you know, I'm, I'm going to have a great day. It's going to be amazing, wonderful, magical life. The book also goes into visualization. To visualize, if you would. Um, it's just visualizing yourself a certain way. I'm going... Perhaps it's landing the job that you want. Landing the career you want. I'm going to do great. I'm going to study hard. I'm going to... I'm going to, this is going to be it. All of this falls under communicating with yourself to build up self-esteem. Then they talk about reframe. Reframing is the process of redefining events and experiences from different points of view. So, by engaging in self-talk and Reframing is maybe you're confused on something or you don't feel the greatest about a certain area or subject. Talk to someone else and they can give you a different point of view. Perhaps it's work. So maybe your boss or a co-worker can be like, oh, no, you, you, you feel like you're not doing so great at your job. And they give you a different perspective. Maybe you're struggling with a concept in your coursework and the professor gives you the teacher gives you a different perspective. You're like, oh, well, maybe I'm not struggling as much as I did am. And it's the same way with relationships. Maybe, like, and when I say relationships, I mean family and friends or a partner, romantic partner. And you think one thing, but by opening up and talking to them, they give you a different perspective. And that different perspective and point of view is what we mean by reframe. You're getting a different point of view. So it helps to clarify your thoughts to help it build up your engagement for self-esteem. Okay, the next it talks about is develop honest relationships. And when I say develop honest relationships, you would think that's pretty straightforward. But we have that thing here. We all have that one friend that's brutally honest. They're not mean. They're just brutally honest. Like, this is how like, okay, I'm going to be like, no, sister, go change. Or, what are you wearing? What are you doing? Or you have that one friend's like, what are you doing with your life right now? Because 
you're a hot mess, you know. That's what I'm talking about with developing honest relationships. <laughs> um, relation. Find someone who's going to be honest with you and not just build up a false all the time. You know, get that one, get that someone that's going to be like, no, that's a pretty bad idea what you're thinking on doing. Perhaps you should go about it differently, or maybe you shouldn't talk to this person that way, or maybe you should cool down for a second before you respond to that email. Someone that's going to be honest with you about life. Surround yourself with positive people. You know, if you're constantly around a group or someone who's negative all the time, there's just so, after so long... It rubs up on you. So I'm not saying if you have friends that tend to be negative, stay away from them. Just, you know, having positive people in your life helps a positive frame of mind. Um, the book also says lose your baggage. So it's being their way of talking about it. It's just kind of letting go of things that have happened that you've had no control over. You cannot change. We cannot change our past. We don't have time machines. And question, if we did have a time machine, would you want to go back? Like, because some theories like, oh, if you go back and if you step on a twig, it could change the whole outfit of the whole of the future. Anyway, tangent. <laughs> Randomness from me. But they're just talking about, you know, these are things that we have no control over. We can't change. So it's taking things that may have, have affected us in a certain situation and letting it go. That's not to say that's for every situation. Because that's not true. Some things we grow from. But. That's what the book has gave us. The book talks about in. Communicating with ourself. For self esteem. Uh, the next thing that the book goes over. Is the perception process. So perception is kind of the alertness or the is all of your senses so perception is what you see what you hear what you smell what you touch what you feel all that is being thrown into the mix with perception so stage one is attention and selection so say you're outside in a park you're in a classroom or you're in an auditorium. So you're somewhere with a lot of things. And there's a lot of noise. There's people talking. There's rustling. There's movement. There's things going on up front. There's things going on up back. There's just, there's just all kinds of stuff going on. Maybe there's announcements. Attention is the act of receiving the stimuli. So it's the act of the hearing or the smelling or the seeing or whatever's going on around you. And selection is when we choose a specific stimuli to focus on. So say you're in a classroom setting and there's kids are talking people are talking noises are going on outside in the hallway noises are going on outside if it's springtime maybe they're cutting grass maybe there's announcements going on maybe there's chairs moving computers are on click 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 like there's just all kinds of stuff going on so selection would be okay the teacher's talking i'm paying attention or if you're in an auditorium setting or if you're at a work meeting you're paying attention to the speaker the next is organization. That's step two is organization in perception. Organization is converting the energy, the information into convenient, understandable, and efficient patterns that allow us to make sense of what we observe. So you have, you know what's going on, you've selected what you're going to pay attention to. And then from that, we take our information and we just, we put it into areas that, makes sense to us we break it down how it makes sense to us and it could be subject or time frame you know whatever the case may be however it makes sense to you breaking it down in your mind um and when it comes with communication so sometimes we miss information but yet we can fill in the blanks that's called closure i do that with writing i don't know if you guys do this but i do this sometimes when i'm writing I write a lot. I would, can write faster than my mind goes sometimes, which is kind of scary because my mind goes professor. So, like, I write. And unless I read it out loud, my mind will fill in if I've missed a word. We put in a word into the story. Now, if I read it out loud, then I notice, hey, 
I totally need to write this in. So then I can make a note, write, you know, write the word in for the next draft. That's what my best example of closure is. Because sometimes we don't get all the information we need when there's a lot going on and we're trying to focus. And sometimes, you know, because of noise, communication process, and this is external, internal. Because maybe we're just having a bad day or we're hungry. Oh, God, it's all close to lunch. Ah! We don't get all the information. So our mind can based off of what we learn and what we know, we put information in, and that's just called closure. The last step in this is interpretation, and this is just taking what you've learned, the information that you've organized, and you're interpreting it. And interpretation is based off of what we know, like what we know past and present. So, if you're in a classroom setting and they're giving you information, you can interpret it. Okay, this is based off of this lesson for this course. You know, it's just, it. interpretation falls under, we assign meaning to it based off of what we know, what we have known and what we currently know. So again, in perception, the three steps are attention and selection, organization and interpretation and then ways that we can enhance our perception when it comes to um, self-awareness is increase your awareness just make yourself more aware just kind of be like okay there, what else is going on here um, it talks about avoiding stereotypes and this falls under that judging a book by its cover calling someone a jock or a nerd even though I call myself a I'm a proclaim self Self-proclaimed nerd, dork, if you would. <laughs> um, you know, by avoiding stereotypes, it helps us in our perception. Because when you say a stereotype, oh, they're a jock. Automatically, someone's go, oh, okay. You know, or they're this or they're that. I just say jock because the book gives the example of jock. Um, by avoiding stereotypes, we open ourselves up for for a deeper perception when it comes to self-awareness. And then the last thing it talks about is checking your perceptions. And within checking your perceptions, it talks about indirect perception checking, which is using your own perceptional abilities to seek additional information to confirm or review your interpretations of someone's behavior. So this is kind of just where we take in ourselves. Oh, do they mean what they mean? Or do they mean what they say? Or... They're acting kind of funny. Like, this is where you kind of internalize what you're receiving when it comes to perception. So then there's direct perception checking, and direct is when you go straight to the source. This is asking someone else whether your interpretations of what you perceive are correct. Okay, so say you're with your buddy, and they're just like, nah, it doesn't seem their normal self. Perhaps they seem a little off, a little angry. So you would, the indirect version of perception checking, would you be going internally going, oh man, they're mad. Are they mad at me? What did I do? And then all of a sudden you're just like replaying like text messages, conversations. Did I miss something? Was I supposed to do something? You know, you, you go through a whole laundry list of things of like, why are they mad? What happened? The direct perception check for this would be you going to them going, hey, What's up? You just don't seem your normal self. Is there something up? Can I help you with something? Can I do something? You want to talk? So that's all it talks about. So we talked about the three steps of perception and then three ways to help in our perception checking world, which is increase your awareness of the world around you. Avoid stereotypes because by avoiding stereotypes, we are more open to perception. And then it's checking your perceptions, you know, internally or directly. All right, folks, it's a lot longer than what I thought it was going to be, but this was all talking about self-awareness and communication. I hope you enjoyed the lesson. Thanks. Bye.